All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Sarah Huffman, and I am the Art Rental and Sales Associate here at the Art Gallery of Alberta. We welcome you to our Meet the Artist series, a part of AGA Live. Here at the gallery, we embrace the teachings of Tatewa, a Cree phrase meaning welcome, there is room. In our house, even the virtual one, everyone is welcome. I'm delighted to be your host for this hour. Joining me from Red Deer today is artist Matt Gould. Before we dive into the subject, I'd like to highlight that this is an interactive event and we'd like to hear from you. You are welcome to use the chat window on the side screen to share your comments as we discuss Matt's current project. If a question goes unnoticed or unanswered at the time, please know that we'll be looking back at that afterwards once we get to the end of the event. Today's conversation is live and some of the themes are political and satirical in nature. We support our audience's right to form their own differing opinions and reactions to any artist's work or statements, while also supporting an artist's freedom of imagination and expression, even though we may not endorse the views and statements as expressed. We aim to spark respectful conversation. Although Matt Gould was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, he has lived in Toronto, Vancouver, the south of France, as well as a seven year stint sailing the seven seas abroad of cruise ships. He has been living in Red Deer, Alberta since the early 2000s, enjoying and taking advantage of the wonderfully complex trails and pathways that crisscross the city. Gould has spent most of his life in the arts and has expressed himself through painting, drawing, fiber, book illustration, singing, acting, <laughs> script writing, <laughs> and theater direction. He has taught contemporary art in process at Red Deer College and acted as artistic director and playwright in residence for the award-winning Treehouse Youth Theater. He has been an active member of the Alberta Craft Council, CARFAC, the Red Deer Arts Council, and Theater Alberta. Matt continues to push boundaries in his studio practice, hoping one day, and I quote, to get it right. Please join me Join me in welcoming our June Meet the Artist, Matt Gould. Yeah. <laughs> oh, everybody. <laughs> yes. So as Sarah was saying, you know who I am. You know why we're here. Um, I'm going to start this evening's conversation and presentation with a little bit of a slideshow. So Sarah, if you can go ahead and load up the first one, that'd be terrific. There we go. So that's my crotch as a 10 year old <laughs> sitting in front of a, a house that I built. So this was just put on to kind of show you how I've always been making things, building things. This was a, a house that I built for my troll. And in the little corner that you might be able to see, there was a secret passage with a bookcase and an exit for them to sneak out. I put those dead trees up. So I just kind of, chose this to say that I've been mucking around on this stuff for a, a super long time. And for me, story has always been important because we'd act out, my brother and I would act out a tremendous number of stories around this little troll house before it disappeared into the mud pile, who knows when. Okay, uh, next slide, if we could. So as Sarah mentioned, I was the artistic director of Treehouse Youth Theater in Red Deer. And this is one of the major puppet pieces that we did in a production from 2013 called Red Deer River Stories. It was the official production, theater production of Red Deer Centenary. So this is a cow called Rosalind of Old Basing, who was a very famous cow in the early 1900s. So I just wanted to show you how I've always kind of combined narrative with, let's say, fictional characters, puppetry, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next one, Sarah. Again, Treehouse Youth Theatre. So these were a series of drawings that I did for the production of Sweeney Todd. I set it in Victorian England and I used as my drawings inspiration from 18th and 19th century um, black and white drawings. So if you can move to the next one. This again shows you sort of puppets. So with those drawn figures behind them, this was a big production number called The Priest. And so each of the characters and the actors and the dancers behind had sort of very crude puppets. 
So once again, over the years, I've been throwing puppets in and working with them and kind of loving those different levels of story, I guess. Uh, next slide. This I just threw in today. I mean, you've got a million images, but it, it goes to kind of my sensibility and the idea that weird, surrealistic sort of stuff, pop culture fits in with regards to color and pattern and just fucking ridiculous whatevers. Pardon my French. So let's move on while I'm blushing here. And a gas mask. So I, I've, I have, as I was going through a lot of my photographs and slides, deciding what we might use as a tiny presentation to kick this off, one of the things that I have done is sort of take pictures of slides and, I mean, take pictures of masks and, um, of course, puppets and animated kind of figures in that way. Next, please. This is a Henry Moore sculpture from Toronto. So it was just an idea to look at that kind of basic shape and the broken down smoothness of it somehow, not necessarily influencing my work, but sort of. Uh, next, please. This was Nick Cave, who was a very famous African-American artist, and he had a, a big exhibition at the Glenbow this year of his sound suits. So he makes these massive, wonderful combinations of assemblages of bits and bobs, and this was one of the masks that he created. So again, I'm always drawn to the face and to the personality and the, the personage. Next. So in this project that I'm working, I've often referred to and gone back to this man's puppets. This is Paul Clay, who was a very famous artist from Switzerland. And in the 1920s and 30s, he was an instructor at Bauhaus in Germany. And he created a series of over 50 puppets for his nine-year-old son, Felix. So he created most of the faces and the bodies. And a woman named Sasha Morgenthaler created a lot of the bodies and the clothing at the beginning. Um, but what I really liked was the sense of the, the primitive and the raw and the great expressive qualities that come from these puppets. Uh, next. This begins to move into my own exploration around masks for my own work. And this was a, a mask called He Likes Fat. And it was from 19, uh, 2013 when I was working with leather, when I got my introduction to leather. So this is based on a cereal box that I took, cut up, decorated and reconstructed so you can wear that mask. So again, you're getting that sense of connecting to the theater, if you will. Uh, next. This comes back to uh, like toys and again, things that are animated, things that you can interact with a little more. This was based on drawings. The, the little drawings in black were from children who were expressing concepts about war. So I, I did the needlework in black and the needlework in white is an expression of peace and joy. So I kind of did a mishmash and these were kids from North America and from Iraq and Iran, Syria, places where those children are both seeing violence, but we're still drawing pictures of flowers. So for me, it was this mishmash. And again, um, a toy that connects somehow. Uh, next. And this is going to lead us into my work now. This was a series of three puppets that I did that are at the Alberta Craft Council that were based on songs by Joni Mitchell, who's a goddess to me as far as I'm concerned. And this is um, Big Yellow Taxi. And they talk about the lights spilling out onto a parking lot and the water in the puddles. And I just got the pinks and the neon lights from that kind of a garish thing. But it's moving into kind of the, the Paul Clay. You can sort of see the abstract quality of it. And then starting to work with fabric. This is all hand dyed fabric using natural dyes like matter and stuff like that. So I think that's the end of the slide thing, Sarah. Okay, here I am. So uh, leading up, this, this first thing that I was hiding behind is actually a puppet of me that I did for a protest rally in February. And there was a protest at City Hall against the United Conservative Party, the UCP. 
And so a group of us got together and I designed the puppets and wrote a script and we did this puppet play. That's the only one that survived. Keith told me to keep it. Otherwise I, I jettisoned all the rest of them. So what's led me to this project is the marrying, if you will, like of theater, because I've been involved with theater for a long time and performance and narrative and storytelling. So for me, storytelling is a big deal and writing scripts is my favorite kind of writing. Um, I like the voices of characters and how they appear and how they begin to function. So one of the things that happened, I've sort of created, I'm the only member really so far of the Red Deer Puppetry Collective. So we're, <laughs> so we're starting to, um, I don't know, well, soon we'll be coming together to do something anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm finding that as an artist, yeah, it's, it's great to be creating things because I do create things. I have to kind of make things. But in this world we're living in right now, as we all know, there's so much going on. This is the first time in my life I'm saying I have to respond not only as a human being, but as an artist. And I've, I've never done this before. I've never sort of, let's say, gotten on a, a soapbox, if you will, or said, I have to talk about this stuff. I have to respond to it. So what's What's led me thus far into this project was coming into a political situation in the province. And, you know, Sarah wrote the disclaimer that there's some kind of political stuff going on around you. People who, people who know me realize that none of this is sort of a surprise. But that puppet show was so well received in February that I'd written that I said, okay, I want to create these smaller puppets that are still responding to what's going on around me and the government, et cetera. So, um, Sarah, does it make sense for me to show some of the puppets? Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, I still can't hear you. Okay, fine. Here we go. We're good, we're so, good. <laughs> there we go. Good. so I have chosen to create a series of puppets, um, representing different ministers of our current government. And mm -hmm. I'm in the midst of writing scripts, small scripts that we hope ultimately uh, will be filmed. So right. we're gonna be turning these little stories and sketches that are used with puppets. So there's kind of a, a lovely childlike buying into that experience. Mm -hmm. There's a, a separation, if you will, from the real person. It's not like I'm standing in front of a camera as a news person or as someone who's doing a parody of a political party or a certain person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna show you the first puppet and I'll talk a little bit about the process, how I sort of created them and uh, all that kind of stuff. So the first one, some of you may recognize them, is our Minister of Health. So this is Tyler Shandro. And as I was working, I was saying to Sarah earlier, I made all of the, the heads at about the same time because these are made with sort of a cardboard base and then plaster and then painting on top. So I created all the heads and then it took me a week or so to begin to drill down into how I wanted to present them, what kind of clothing, because as a theater person, when you're looking at costume, Right. It leads you down the path to character, right? Mm -hmm. So I've turned this guy into a surgeon. So you can see the blood on his uniform. And I gave him, I gave him these pink kind of, or purpley kind of scrubs, right? You sort of see maybe nurses wear, and there's a little bandana. Yeah. And then that's that surgeon's hat, right? With the mask. So uh, again, I haven't worked on his script yet per se, mm -hmm. but it will come as I, as I now have him fully formed. Mm -hmm. And then of course, if you see him walking away, <laughs> I hope somebody saw that. There's this hairy arse hanging out of his, out of his hospital gown. So again, like when you're telling stories and you're mm -hmm. working on stories, um, it, you want to spend that time kind of developing the character, building layer up after layer, at least at least I do. Right. Um, I'm gonna bring up 
Oh, and by the way, as Sarah said before, if there are any questions as we're going along, like interrupt, wave a, a digital hand, give me a digital finger, whatever you have to do. We did get a comment from Leslie Crawford letting you know that she loves your bow tie. Oh, <laughs> well, thanks, Leslie. That's very <laughs> Wonderful. Now, and who's this? Okay. This is Adriana Lagrange, and she is our Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. So she is uh, a very devout Catholic and a right to lifer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she did that was quite controversial shortly after she took power was she used um, school board money to bus a bunch of high school students from Red Deer to Edmonton to an anti abortion. Uh, mm -hmm. March. Okay. So that made the news in a variety of ways. Jason Kenny didn't say anything. And then a week or so later, literally, there was that student led walkout for the GSAs for the gay. Right. The Great school. Straight Alliance. Yeah. Yeah. Gay and Straight Alliance. And Jason Kenny said, you know, it's fine. You're protesting, but you shouldn't be taking any time out of school. Mm -hmm. It took like 20 minutes to a half an hour out of school because I went to the one in Red Deer. Yeah. And yet she had them go to Edmonton for five hours on the school board money, calling it kind of an important outing. So she doesn't have any gold stars in my book. So if you can see her, her, her hair, it's not really hair, but it's a mm -hmm. crown that's based on 18th century Mexican and Latin American Santos. Mm -hmm. So it's like My Lady of Guadalupe. So right. there's this kind of crone because she's sort of like Madonna or right. the Madonna, right? Because she's giving herself that kind of importance. Right. And right. what is that what is that material, Matt? So this material is just a a black cotton gingham. Okay. And then this is wool felt. So then on her cross on the front, mm -hmm. I made it quite decorative. And yet the person hanging on the cross is like a child. So in other words, She's crucifying education in the province, right. if you, want, you know, it, because I'm getting sort of my druthers out opinion wise. Mm -hmm. And then I use the colors of black and white and red because those are quite fascist colors, right? So they're related to strong dictators. They're mm -hmm. not soft. They're not unequivocal. They're very strong. Mm -hmm. So um, she's covered in symbolism. And then mm -hmm. I've given her a back. I don't know if anybody is that. Can people read it? Is it backwards? No. No, we can see. Yeah. So it's uh, Adriana Lagrange and JC Forever. Mm -hmm. So they go back to sort of religious clothing and symbolism. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to talk a little bit about the painting on the faces. It's kind of crude and very rough, partially mm -hmm. because I used a gauze plaster on the form, and the gauze plaster is quite crude and rough. So uh, it was kind of nice because it takes the paint in a certain kind of aggressive way and a sloppy way. Right. I couldn't get into and didn't want to get into a lot of very careful dabbling. Right, it doesn't give you that clean line like it would on a canvas or paper. Yeah, exactly, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was just uh, messy, but I also go back to the Paul Clay images because they were very kind of crude mm -hmm. and um, I guess instant spontaneous in a sense, right? There's a lot of life right. to them. So I wanted to, I was using acrylics. I'm, I'm a, was an oil painter mm -hmm. and using acrylics is different because they dry so quickly. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So then, but then the great thing is you can come back and rework it right away. Right. Right. Um, I'll take you to someone who's of a different community. So I had to make a Rachel Notley puppet. And here she is. And for me, this is this is a very uh, lovely hand dyed in, with using chamomile, hand dyed um, large and heavy linen. Wow. And each of these designs were, I've got a, this felting machine that pushes a bunch of needles in it so okay. it can drive a pattern from behind. Oh, okay. So I've given her a bunch of circles and I've joined all of the circles because she's all about connecting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm pulling people together. 
So it's kind of a smart, this is sort of like an, an apres ski outfit and it's very sort of Coco Chanel, and <laughs> yeah. kind of an A-line, right? Yeah, very form-fitting. <laughs> yeah, 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 she's a doll, bless oh, her heart. So uh, hers, you know, I didn't give her uh, anything much of a character. There was no, mm -hmm. there was no drive to do it, no point in that sense, because I'm, right. I'm not being critical of her. You might not like everything she's done, but you know, from my perspective, I say yippee. So then I had to put the um, NDP gay and lesbian button on her. Yeah. Because of course, lefties and left leaners, you know, will wear buttons and stick them on. And wonderful. Can we chat a little bit more about the process for her chamomile dress? Because oh, to sure. me, I just want to know how I can do that for myself. <laughs> well, you know, what? It, it's, <laughs> it's quite a process. You So when you're using natural dyes to dye a fabric, you have mm -hmm. to um, scour it first. And by scouring it, it means it's washing it in, in baking soda and a, and a natural cleanser. Okay. To take all of the oil out and all of the grease. Mm -hmm. And then you have to give it a tannin bath. And a tannin bath is... Uh, tannins, yeah. they come in different different sort of hues and colors. You can get a clear tannin, which is from oak, an oak burr. Oh, okay. And then you cook that, and that has you've got to open up all the fibers. Neat. So what you have to do is you're you're opening the fibers so that it'll take the dye bath. Right. Because this is a a cellulose based fabric, as opposed to wool, which is a protein. Right. Right. Wool and silk are protein and cotton and linen are and hemp are these guys. So then you give it a bath in this chamomile dye yeah. for hours and then you then you have to dry it, then you have to steam it. It's a long process. So it's, yeah. it's five Absolutely. steps. So I don't I've got a quite a bit of dyed fabric that I've done, but I'm sort of um careful how I use it. Right. And because the process is so long um did you go from one puppet to another and slowly work on the fabrics and the paintings how was your how was your process like that oh good question so um i started all the heads at the same time right. essentially within the within a few days because they have to be built plastered dried yeah and then painted so that took you know about a week mm -hmm. And then moving into the costumes, as I said, I gave it like a week or two weeks almost before I began to start to work and I'd work on each one and I'd have to sort of get like an idea or a vision for them. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and then say, okay, this works for this character. It kind of makes sense, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, like you mentioned, it plays into their de character development and what they're wearing reflects what your thoughts are and and how they're going to continue living as puppets, right? Right, oh, exactly, sure. Yeah. Because at first I thought, well, I'm gonna make them so I can take the costumes off and I could mm -hmm. rebuild them into other things. And then I said, ah, I'll glue them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a process, we'll just glue it. Well, you know what I thought? I thought because these people are gonna be in power for a few years, mm -hmm. and I can imagine if this if this process goes on, and my response to them is still critical in the way that it's critical. Right. And I like this project, and it doesn't kill me. <laughs> you know, I'll uh, I'll want to keep banging away and finding new ways to speak with them. Right. Absolutely. So here is His Holiness Pope Kenny. So. This again, because both he and Lagrange mm. uh, you know, are such noisy, avowed Catholics, right? And they're making a lot of show of, of their religiosity for better mm -hmm. or for worse. And so I said, okay, screw it. I'm going to make him the Pope. Right. I thought of making him like a dictator in mm -hmm. a sense, but I thought, no, that in some ways is, well, I'm not saying this is very subtle, but this mm -hmm. gives for me a different twist. Absolutely. I've given him, of course, the cross. And right at the top, I put a hammer. Mm -hmm. because he's, there's nothing subtle about him. Right. And if you can see the two Milagros in the middle, 
It's a foot crushing a heart. Oh. <laughs> so really what I think this guy is doing, again, these are my you know, thoughts and feelings about him, is he's, he's crushing the province in the way he responds to absolutely everything and presents everything. He's so hard, I guess, you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be any humanity. Right. And of course, there's the Pope's hat. So there's a, and there's also a kind of a Punch and Judy feel to the puppets because they're quite crude. Right, right. So I might have them if I've got them together in a, in a scene, they might be, you know, going at it. Right. And here's the back of his, that's his papal train. Mm -hmm. So you can see the oil, the oil well right there. Yeah. And then you've got agricultural animals and industry, industry and all that kind of stuff. So we've uh, kind of gotten him on this. And this is a really beautiful linen tea toweling fabric that I got. Because I looked up, I looked up clothing and costumes that the popes have worn and would wear, like right. their sort of clothing. There's lots of gold, there's lots of white, mm -hmm. lots of embroidery. So as you can see right there on the cross, there's that fine embroidery that's a bit of a, a nod to that. Right. You may also notice that on this piece right at the bottom there, I've left the threads. Mm. So then if you're looking at it from a sort of a deeper level, at least when I'm doing it, I'm saying, okay, I leave the threads on because mm -hmm. maybe they're kind of unraveling or they're not as perfect as they look like, or there's, there's that sense of yeah. um, flaw, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what came first on uh, on Kenny's puppet? Was it his uh, train or hat or? The hat came first. The hat came first, yeah. And it was and then it kind of drove the process for what the rest of his garb was. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I woke and I and I said, okay, because if I'm, I did, I did Lagrange first or before Kenny. So once I'd established kind of her let's say religiosity or the symbolism around it. Mm -hmm. I moved on to him and I said, okay, you know, as I said before, do I want to consider him as a dictator? Would I like to go down that way with like a brown shirt and a uniform and a, a kind of a symbol on the arm? Right. Is that how I want to go? But then I thought, no, because he keeps, he must be some kind of a scary, terrible Catholic in the sense that he, he does all this stuff that is so nasty, it seems. Mm -hmm. Any consideration for people. At least that's my sense of him, right? Right. So, um, are any questions coming through? Or are we just? Uh... Uh, nope, no questions coming through. All right. Um, maybe let's chat about uh, what this looks like in the future and the longevity of this project. Sure. Right. So, um, for those of you who don't know, my all my formal education was in film and animation mm -hmm. and I used it essentially never in my whole career because I'm kind of a, a technophobe and a chicken shit. So, you know, I, I didn't get opportunities. I might've, I didn't push things through because I was always writing scripts and wanting to direct and things like that. Um, so for me, this is bringing up the real possibility of in a sense, moving back into film, right? creating great little stories, I hope, great little stories, with these characters, and then developing my film sense and all that kind of stuff. So I see them, as I said, I think a little earlier, um, giving them a number of years of life as this government stays in power. But for me, this is also a jumping off point because I'm anxious to create Puppets from other ways, uh, puppets in other ways, maybe just using painted, dyed fabric, um, photographic kind of playing around with them, stuff like that. Maybe creating other stories or going to folk tales and creating puppets around folk tales. Cool. So yeah. It's a it's a starting point and a jumping off point for me. Yeah. Do you think that these pieces might be available for rental or purchase at some point or even commission? Well, you know, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm sort of thinking, well, let's say that someone wants to buy their puppet. I can't imagine Jason Kenny 
buying his to do anything other than burn it. But um, I would be certainly open to it with the proviso that I'm kind of holding on to them and sort of using them because I'm not, I'm really not ready to let them go now, even though in the future they might, because I'll move on, I'll move on to different things. Mm -hmm. Their time will have come and gone. Yeah. So it's a possibility. And I have no idea where this impulse is going to take me and, and what's, what's going to transpire down the road. Mm -hmm. I'm like super excited now about, I guess, responding to my environment and, and giving myself permission to write this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And as I was saying, platform in order to do so. Yeah. And as I, as I was saying earlier today, I've decided because I've started to look up, um, like libel laws. And as I said before, I'm kind of a scared mm -hmm. cat. So the idea of really calling these people who they are in the films and stuff is a bit nervous making. Yeah. Um, but, but so the idea was that I was going to create these series of films and I was tentatively titling them uh, Dispatches from the Republic of Alberta Stan. <laughs> Ta-da. So then they might be little news vignettes, right? So, yeah. and I, I was thinking today of the kind of serials that would happen before feature length movies were shown in the 1930s and 40s during the war. And they'd have these news reels. So these might be small news reels. I don't know. So I'm just, um, I'm allowing the characters to be built. Mm -hmm. if you look at Shandro, for example, his character is fairly clear. Right. And this, this curtain behind me, whether you can sort of see it or not, this curtain with the, you see with the bloody handprints and the, the torn corners and stuff, mm -hmm. this is Shandro's background. This is the um, Alberta Health Services logo. So he's going to come popping out of the curtains and whatever, mm -hmm. right? So these are the beginning of some of the set pieces. Yeah. All right. It looks like we do have a few questions here in the chat. We'll start with Cynthia. Will you be doing another public pup show? Well, another public one. Well, uh, yes, potentially for sure, because these, all these puppets, I've, I've actually made quite a large um, puppet theater mm -hmm. or one side of it, which is ridiculously heavy and solidly built, but stupid. So um, that is certainly a possibility because some of these, you know, I might trot out to events and they become part of a live interaction. You know, when I was a number of years ago and I was looking at puppets as well, um, there is or was a puppet group in Syria that was against the government and they stuffed their puppets in the back of cars and they would drive from small town to small town in Syria and their stakes were very high. I mean, they would bring these puppets out. They would do these super short, very critical shows of the government because they were mm -hmm. against the government and then pop them in the car and drive away because they could have been arrested and executed. So for me, yes, you know, when we did that puppet show in February, we were quite nervous. I mean, even though we knew the people were there were protesting the UCP and the government, right? Yeah. So... But all of us, the three puppeteers, we were really quite nervous because there's been quite a violent pushback, you know, and the election was pretty hard. So mm -hmm. a long way around it is, yeah, um, that is always a possibility. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's quite a vulnerable position to be in as well, I could imagine. Well, especially with a big puppet theater, I can't move. <laughs> and you're, you're suddenly caught with your drawers down, so to speak, and you can't move. Right. All right. We do have another one here from Leslie. How long does it take to make one puppet? Oh, okay. Um, so again, it depends, right? So let's say, let's say it takes about a day, a half a day to a day. Once I'm in the groove with the fabric and the materials and the, and the mm -hmm. concept for what they're going to wear, so to speak, so I'd say about a day, but if we're, yeah, even including the painting and stuff, although it's not all one day because it has to dry, it has to be painted, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then you can work on the other puppets while 
that one's drying or yeah. 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 So, but I'm really finding I'm, I'm loving. And see now, even as I'm sitting here surrounded by these, there is a real life to them and a real personality to them because, uh, well, I feel it. Mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Another question for you okay. from Glenn. Do you make puppets for a particular role or character, or does the character emerge as you make the puppet? Okay, well, well, these ones, because they're very particular and very targeted, mm -hmm. they, um, in a sense, I kind of knew what I was planning to do with them to start with, right? Because I said, okay, I want to nail these four or five people that are really bothering me right so their personalities were there i i looked up pictures of them and i think in many ways they are representative of them they're not like super clean portraits mm -hmm. but there is something of the element of them i've also made kenny as you can maybe notice so let's um i'll put kenny beside oops rachel so Oops. So here's Kenny and there's Rachel. So you see how much bigger her head is. Oh yeah. Right? So I've given her more stature and therefore from, from my sense, a little more importance, a little more power. And I was thinking in the, in the film production of him, he might come on like this and then he'd say, hey, Where's my box? <laughs> and someone brings the box and he goes, look, that's better. Right, right. Of course, you know, we shorten all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, Glenn, in, in answer to that, let's say I let's say in the future I want to do some original stories and original puppets. Then the puppets may come from characters that I've already developed. Mm -hmm. But they could, you know, they could go in reverse. So Right, absolutely. We do yeah. have a question from Sheila as well. Will there be any more puppets in this series? For example, Jason Nixon? Why, yes, Sheila. <laughs> I was um, not saving worst for last, but uh, this was the first puppet whose, whose body I began to work on. So this is the Minister of the Environment and Parks. So part of me, if you look at this, it's kind of reminiscent of a clown. Mm -hmm. So therefore there's a bit of disrespect on my part, not to trash clowns, but right. If right. we call someone a clown, we don't talk to them with great respect, but also it's like a flower petal. So therefore mm -hmm. another subtext is the environment mm -hmm. and his gloves, if you can see them are made with a floral fabric, right? Mm -hmm. And got brown overalls and a, a plaid shirt because he's a country boy and there's this little rabbit so again you know I, I'm I'm kind of hoping you hoping to use counterpoint in the sense that there he is looking kind of cute with this bunny but he's mm -hmm. kind of not cute to nature and then on the back is the tail end of the bunny right and this is the one who's um, I'm quite a far way down the road with his script so I can show you while we're talking about him, I'll show you the, the first background I've painted. It's not finished yet. So if you can see it, whoops. Oh, there we go. So then you've got the ATV mm -hmm. and you have the camper van and then you're gonna have him right in the front. So and will anybody be joining him in that scene or is it just him? So far it's just a solo one, except what's gonna join him is this fantastic fire. Nice. <laughs> so I've made a fire, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And here is, I, I made a, can you read that? Buzzkill. Right, so this is his, during this piece, insects come and bother him because he's out camping. Mm -hmm. so and he asks why why in heaven's name did the Lord make mosquitoes? And he brings this buzz kill and sprays it around. And I've given him a where are they now? Here they are. And I've given him 
like a wiener roast stick with mm -hmm. dinosaurs on it. <laughs> so it's kind of like, is he a dinosaur? Is he because he's in love with fossil fuels? Is he using more dinosaurs? I also made a, he's got a marshmallow too, so. Yeah. It depends on what happens. Lots of elements for the puppets, for sure. We yeah. do have another question from Marilyn. Uh, is there a reason that it appears to be a blockhead? Uh, or did you have any um, any reasoning behind the shapes of the heads for each puppet? Yeah. Um, so I have this stuff. So here's uh, another puppet head that I began to work on as a prototype. Okay. And it's more of like a human head shape. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, fine, because I, I love this as well. Mm -hmm. because it's going to be really fun to play with. However, when I was cleaning out our storage room, I found a bunch of small gift boxes. Mm -hmm. And these are the gift boxes. So yes, yes, oh. Marilyn, in a sense, yeah. These are, I could say they're blockheads, squareheads. Mm -hmm. Use that as a, a response to them. But also, these gave really lovely... Um, shapes and 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 physical structure for me to work with right because what is the process for so you start with your your little gift box and then what is the what is the next step do you have to prime it in any way or what nope. that? so the the neck is a, a toilet paper roll okay so size for fingers so i might cut a little hole in the bottom of the box tape it on you know you can be quite crude you can just use rough tape right and then um let's see if i bring a nose well here i'll bring i'll bring shandro back because he's got the biggest nose in my cast so you can see it from the side mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the little cuppy things from a an egg carton oh okay right, so you tape it on and then you tape anything on like the face you can see the side of the face Right. The mouth, I mean, you can use newspaper, which I do, and then tape, and you can be quite crude as you're putting it on. And then I've got this strip of, it's this white plaster in a roll, okay. and you cut a strip or a piece, and then literally you take it through the water, and then you can form it. Right, absolutely. It's fantastic. So could, similar to paper mache, yes, more fancy. <laughs> yeah, but easier. And yeah. you could also, I could have been more careful and been much smoother about it because I, but I'm kind of lazy and I like to, I kind of like the raw, the rawness of it. Mm -hmm. And again, that throws us back to the Paul Clay uh, puppets, right? Because there's kind of a, a roughness to them, which I really like. Right, right. And we have another question here as well. How long is the thought process before making the puppet? Um, and I'll just add on that as well. How much research um, have you been doing before taking on each character? So um, I'm part of a writing group that mm -hmm. is um, pretty constantly writing letters to the government. We come together and we sort of say, okay, this is bothering us or this we like or whatever it is. Mostly this bothers us because it's this government. Mm -hmm. So then we'll um, come together with our ideas and then pop letters off into the mail. So. I've been doing a lot of reading. This goes more towards the scripts. Okay. Because um, if I look at what Jason Kenny's been doing or Jason Nixon or Tyler Shandro or whatever it is, mm -hmm. I'll look at some of their policies and some of the issues and the way they're handling them. So that will infuse the, the character. Mm -hmm. um, and I do quite a bit of research. So I'll do quite a bit of reading. Mm -hmm. But as I said before, I'm now at the stage in my life and in my career where I'll sit down and do some work, like say intense work, a half an hour, an hour or something, but then I won't push it. I'll go away, I'll right. let a new idea pop in because in the past I wouldn't have. In the past I'd have had this feeling of it being imperative that I ground this thing out and got it done. Right. Now I can say, you know what? I can go sit, I can go think, and then I'll come back so it's working maybe smarter, at least for my process, right? Right. Well, and we had a conversation a while ago uh, in our rental and sales that uh, when you were doing a lot of textile work, 
that it you can't necessarily put things back together once you've cut it. Right. It's kind of cut and you have to deal with it. So that's interesting that your practice is continually evolving so that once you're inspired, you still have that reflection period as well. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's funny that you're mentioning that because since I started working primarily in textiles about 20 some years ago now, mm -hmm. um, my process has really slowed down because you're making and you're fitting and you're sizing. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, a, it's in a sense emphasizing craft in the way that it wasn't as a painter, there was a spontaneity, uh, a speed mm -hmm. with which I'd work at least in my younger days. <laughs> and I've grown to really, I've grown to really appreciate this and sort of say, it's okay. You know, we've got in this society, this idea that artists are, craze and fast and they're going like this all the time and they come out and they're geniuses and they right. produce this thing in some great big orgasm of artistic temperament right mm -hmm. the reality for me and for lots of artists is you know what the act of creating is really just creating a problem solving that problem creating mm -hmm. another problem and solving that problem so let's say my problem is i want to create puppets right so I've presented that as a problem. Then the next step is, ah, what kind of puppets? And then you go down the next and you say, okay, do I have the energy to do this? Or am I going to make that, et cetera, et cetera. So really you, you, one can pull it back and say, guess what? This lovely little step-by-step -step thing. And then even though some people might say, you know, for example, textile work doesn't feel as spontaneous as throwing a bucket of paint on a <laughs> canvas, for example, right? right. Um, but what's happening is when I'm in the midst of work, I get these lovely surprises and I'll say, oh, oh, yeah, I can I can do that. I can modify it this way. I can add that. So it becomes um, really lively. Mm -hmm. you know, someone might look at it and say, boy, look at all that work and all that planning. Yes, of course, there's lots of work and lots of planning. But when I was talking about the threads on Jason Kenny's costume, mm -hmm. not cutting them, letting them be, letting it have that roughness, right? Right. So um, I'm still totally loving it. That's awesome. We do have another question from Glenn. Are you primarily making puppets right now or are you making art in some of the other media you work in as well? Funny you should mention that. <laughs> I've just... A friend of mine and I are working. She does a lot of the technical stuff and helps with the fitting and pulling together. I have them in the house. I, I could have brought them, but there are three kinds of animal shaped cushions that okay. we that we stuffed with um, cut up pieces of cotton. So they've got a nice vintage feel, a very solid feel. Mm -hmm. This is sort of on a project that we're working on uh, a little bit. But in answer to that, I would have to say that as I get excited about these and maybe we see what begins to happen with them, with the films and all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. I sort of only have so much, let's say, energy to devote to something, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I ain't dead yet. <laughs> well, and this project is really neat because it does encompass a lot of the areas that you have worked on in the past. So it's kind of an all encompassing project. Yeah. Right. It's not just focusing on one certain thing. It's bringing all of the elements that you've worked on. Yeah, well, exactly. So I'm also, I'm also feeling comfortable to give it the time that it needs because mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons I said earlier that I didn't really pursue a lot of film stuff was because I'm kind of a machine phobe. So I've got a camera with the, you know, if I've got my phone, I've got other stuff. I'm going to look at getting a mic. I'm going to learn how to edit using this technology. And it terrifies the crap out of me. And so therefore I put it off. So I'll go and I'll make this fire before yeah. I'll go and learn how to, you know, do something technical. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to reach out. I'm reaching out. <laughs> for people to, uh, you know, technically, I don't know, step yeah. up, help, whatever, because, you know, film isn't something you can just do one person on your own, but I'm creating these little worlds and mm -hmm. along with the scripts so that when I really reach out for help, then we'll be able to like in a production meeting way, because when I was in theater, mm -hmm. 
you know, you have this the costume and stage and lighting and set, and then we have production meetings. So that's that's what'll come with this. But yeah, wonderful. <laughs> I ain't in a panic totally. <laughs> We've got time. We're in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I think we do have some time for a couple more questions. If anybody wants to uh, message that in the chat function. It's very funny doing this because, I mean, I'm assuming there are some humans out there, obviously, because, you know, I've been getting a few questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's very odd talking to myself. I mean, I see you. My eyes are pointing <laughs> to you. Right, right. But yeah. it's very odd, this mirror, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really nice to get a, a feel for your studio space as well and seeing where you create and that knowing that it's not a perfect space where, you know, everything's in, in alignment. And <laughs> Look at ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Isn't that beauteous? <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. It's art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think we will wrap it up. Okay. Thank you so much for having this discussion with us today, Matt. It definitely is an honor to work with you and just see where this project is going and, and have these open communications. It's really wonderful. Well, thanks for inviting me and um, goodbye, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for joining us today. The AGA team continues to work hard to bring you art, creative projects to do at home, and engage with you daily. We look forward to seeing you at the Art Gallery of Alberta in Art Rentals and Sales, where you can purchase some of Matt's work or rent it as well. Uh, if you do have questions about that, you can head over to our website, www.youraga.ca slash visit slash rent or buy art. And if you have further questions for me or our team, just shoot an email to artrental at youraga.ca. Until next time, stay safe, stay curious, and stay connected with us. Thanks again, Matt. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.